Hey everybody, I'm Captain Tommy Scoville and you are on the lifeboat. What's going on? Hope you're having a good morning. Squirrel, can it? Boy, that cat is on one this morning, people. Hopefully my voice starts to put this cat into a different mood because she would like to sing louder than I do. There she comes. I'm telling you, that cat is hell on wheels if I'm not doing a show. Just loud like you would not believe. Uh wanted to bust out a uh, Professor Tommy show. I've known one of these in a, I don't think I've done one of these in a very long time. I was, I was trying to, to thumb back through one, and I haven't done one in a hot minute. And you know what? I probably need to do one right now more than I ever have. Uh, because there is just a hellacious amount of misinformation that gets kicked around on the uh, fentanyl. Uh, on the fentanyl front. Um the opioid crisis in general, but the fent the fentanyl thing, uh, <clears throat> and the trank stuff and the xylazine, the difference between fentanyl, carfentanyl. Um, so, about three thousand two hundred years BC, the Sumerians figured out that the sap from the poppy could treat pain. Very very rudimentary uh, version, obviously. Of uh, of what was to later be, um, you know, treated in a bunch of different ways, boiled, uh, and then chemical processes uh, added, so that they could take that and turn it into. Hey, Nick, what's happening? How are you, my brother? Fourteen months. Damn, it's a long time. My my uh, brother Nick. I am the noise opera. My favorite people on the boat. Just a good cat. Really solid. Solid good cat. Speaking of good cats, my cat is raising hell. Uh, a ton of misinformation, right? So the morphine molecule 3,400 years ago was first discovered, loosely. Then the morphine molecule actually got discovered and got uh, synthesized. Bear catches a hell of a lot of crap for taking morphine uh, and adding one uh, acetyl a molecule to it or something along those lines that then allowed it to pass the blood-brain barrier, turning this from morphine to heroin, a much better painkiller, by the way. All Bear was looking to do, believe it or not, was find a less addictive, <laughs> a less addictive version of morphine. Morphine was a great painkiller, but people were getting addicted to it. So they were trying to find something less addictive. Heroin, as it turns out, was Bear's uh, answer to the less addicting uh, painkiller. You know what I don't have on? Glasses. Boy, oh boy. Let's see something. Kath, I am nervous about the ER doc who gave me tramadol. How bad is, uh, am I scared? I worked damn hard these past six to eight months. Now, Lacey, best thing to do, right, um, is have a very long uh, conversation with the doctor. However, if you take the tramadol, how it is written on the label, if you are not capable of doing that, get it in the hands of someone else who doles it out to you the way that it is written on the label. And do not take it after you no longer feel pain. Now, I'm not capable of that. I mean, I'm not. But I know me. I'm also wildly self-aware. I also know that tramadol would not light my switch. Right? True story. Tramadol would not start me down that road. It wouldn't. It's not, it's not that kind of drug. I don't know your habit, Lacey. I know mine really well. Tramadol does not light my... Tramadol is a painkiller, to be sure. It is. It is different. There's something really, really different about Tramadol. Um, honestly, it... Uh, you worked... Oh, so wait a second. You, you were on Hydromorpha. Okay, so you were on Dilaudid. Yeah, don't worry about that. I'm sorry. I'm not laughing. I, I mean, I am laughing. Uh, if you were addicted to Dilaudid... Tramadol is not going to let you up. Tramadol is not going to lead you back to Dilaudid unless you eat the bottle, right? If, you, if you're doing what it says on the outside of the label as a drug addict, and I'm not a doctor, 
but I've abused the crap out of Dilaudid. I've done as much hydromorphone as anyone you'd ever want to meet, and that is a unbelievably strong opiate and a biatch to get off of. It has something, uh, and I'm not trying to trigger anybody. It has a unique property to it that Lacey uh, knows about that um, the rest of you may not, but it has a pins and needles effect that is very unique to hydromorphone. It is, and people are going to go, oh, I get that on morphine. Everybody gets that on pain meds. You get it 8,000 times stronger on hydromorphone than you get it on anything else. And uh, you either hate it or you love it, but the people who love it, um, it's a very, very difficult uh, uh, pain medication to uh, to break away from. Um, and we have we have a guy on the boat who's doing it now, stepping off of it. And it's it's just a really, really strong drug. I would not be wildly concerned about trimadol, um, especially if you're taking it the way it says it on the uh, on the on the bottle. And I'm assuming my assumption is that you told the doc that you had a problem, right? If you because if I if I went in and I told the doctor that I had a pain um, um, prescription problem, tramadol would probably be something that he would write. Especially if I told him that it was hydromorphone or something like that that I had been addicted to. That's that's my humble opinion. Okay, so what's the deal with all of the uh, the stories concerning people who come in contact with fentanyl and drop dead? Right, because we hear this story all the time, right? And this is starting to do us a disservice, right? In this war on drugs thing, these stories are the equivalent of you're going to develop breasts if you keep smoking pot, right? One line of cocaine and you're going to die. One hit of crack and you're addicted for life. We say things like that, right? Then kids figure out that what what they're hearing isn't true. You see, what what parents are being told, what you're hearing in the news all the time is, police officer comes in contact with fentanyl, right? Drops dead on the scene or drops and needs Narcan on the scene or whatever. People asking, are dollar bills safe? My kid touching a dollar bill going to kill them. Car fentanyl, right? Car fentanyl. Coming into contact with car fentanyl can absolutely get you wildly, wildly affected by the uh, drug. But regular fentanyl is different. The analog crap they're selling on the street, that's not car fentanyl. So no joke, what's set out as a way to keep kids from wanting to do this has become a way that dealers are saying, check it out, it's safe. Bag of fentanyl, my finger is in it. Huh? Look at that. Stirring this around, stirring this around, stirring this around. Eh? Well, if it was that stuff you were talking about, I'd be dead, right? Honestly, they take out the M30 pills and roll them in their fingers. Obviously, ain't fentanyl. Right here. Disinformation is so much worse than no information. So there's a drug out there called carfentanil. Coming in contact with it can kill you. The odds that anybody has sniffed it up a $1 bill is not very good, right? The odds are not very good, I should say. Yesterday, if you saw me on Surviving the Survivor, the gentleman from uh, the DEA said three grains of salt. I've never read that. I've always read one, and I've read it in a bunch of places. Now, he worked for the Drug Enforcement Agency, which would lead me to believe that he's probably pretty well educated in it. Let's say he's right and I'm wrong, and it takes three grains of it. How are you going to take three grains of salt and cut that into a pile of powder big enough so that then that can be split among six people? Doesn't happen, right? So it's not a terribly effective drug. <laughs> to deal you say well what if the dealer doesn't care oh no the dealer cares if the if the guy buying the product pisses and moans about it all day now you take a gram of powder how much is that 
a sweet and low pack. A pack of sweet and low has a gram of powder in it. Dump that out on a desk. Take three grains of salt and put it next to it and go, how am I going to make that into a pile? Where if I then separate that pile into four lines, everybody's going to get some. It doesn't work that way. Someone is not going to get any. More than likely, two people aren't going to get any, and you're playing the, the shell game. But the person that gets it is going to die. Two people feel nothing. One leaves planet Earth. So for that reason, there's not a lot of car fentanyl on the street. Every once in a while, some jackass will try to figure out a way. Oh, I got an idea. If you take it and then you pulverize the stuff and you mix it with, uh, you know, this kind of chemical and then you and it never works and people die in the process. But it's not the norm. The norm is a bunk street version of fentanyl, an analog of alpha fentanyl, the real drug. It is deadly. Two milligrams can kill you. We don't need to exaggerate that anymore for kids. Right? I promise that's good enough. Two milligrams is not a lot. It's a hellaciously small amount. You can very easily Google what two milligrams looks like and show it to your kids. It's it's not a big pile of powder. Now, I'll be real honest. Do you think that they're going at the pill press <laughs> and making sure that every one of those pills comes in just under two milligrams of fentanyl? I friggin' assure you that's not how it's done. If my uh, brother Johnny were here and he's not, he could tell you that there was a day I sat in front of a pill press cranking down, right? I did it. We made we made pills once. A lot of people have done it. Now, I didn't uh I didn't make fent pills. We were we were making uh, disco biscuits. We were making ecstasy or some version thereof, right? But the stuff they're pressing into pills now, if you screw that pill up, Somebody at a, at a nightclub isn't going to get way higher than the person next to them. They might not. You overdosed the crap out of somebody with one of those pills, right? And I'm not being funny or anything else, but they ended up playing with themselves. Like, really, that's what happened when, when people overdose, their eyes tended to, to close and they tended to start rubbing on themselves in ways that would get them arrested in public. But no one was going to drop dead. The stuff that these people are making now with zero quality control, right? You heard the guy from the from the DEA, if you were on Surviving the Survivor yesterday, he said the pill mills are running around the clock, cranking out these things. Uh, what he didn't bring up, which is uh, interesting because it is a established fact that any DEA agent on the planet will tell you that they say if they're lucky, they catch 20% of what comes across. So when... The statistic comes out that there were more pills captured last year than there were people in America. 330 million people in America and enough deadly doses for 360 million deadly doses or some such crap. More than enough to kill every single person in America was seized. That means five times that got through. Well, ain't that a bitch? And that's based on what? I mean, in all honesty, what's that based on? Who who came up with that? Because I'd be willing to bet you any amount of money. They don't have a clue how much of it's coming across. But here's my experience. The, uh, the gentleman said, you know why the drugs are so cheap now? Because nobody wants them anymore. Because there's fent in all of them. The drugs are so cheap because of a little thing we call supply and demand. There are many pills on the street that the price of them is dropping if i got a thousand of them to sell and spanx calhoun's got a thousand of them to sell and johnny scoville's got a thousand of them to sell and you're one of our friends chances are you're getting pretty cheap pills right well at the rate they're coming into this country everybody has got these pills in every single state if you had told me that the podunk, beautiful, 
breathtakingly beautiful state that I grew up in, Norman Rockwell state that I grew up in, would be the fastest growing state in the union in terms of drug overdoses. Now, that's per capita, but 300% increase or something uh, from, uh, from the previous year. It's, it's horrific. When I was in college, there had never been a heroin bust in the state. <laughs> Now, I'm not 26 years old, but I also was not in college a million years ago. You know, I mean, it was the 80s. Boy, have we come a long way. But there are a bunch, a bunch of things being said that are absolute and utter horse crap that we've got to stop saying because it's not helping this, this war on drugs in any way. It's not helping our kids. In fact, it's killing them. Right. So all you got to do is touch this stuff and it's going to kill you. If we continue to say that to our kids, having a guy shake a handful of pills in his hand. Starts looking like the same thing that we say when we, you got to test those pills means you need a friggin strip. Right? You got to crush off a little bit of powder. You got to get it wet. You got to put the, the strip on it. Right. Not if the dealer can touch it in the bag, it's safe. That's a really crappy thing. Honestly, if we're conveying that to our kids, that's a bad idea. The idea of telling your kids the truth, if you would like them to, to grow to full maturity right now, telling them the truth about drugs is a really good idea. Touching this stuff, taking over two milligrams of this stuff means you're going to die. So if the guy holding that bag at 16 years old can tell you, where those pills were made, right? And that he watched somebody measuring out that two milligrams that they put in each pill, probably pretty unlikely. Son, daughter, probably pretty freaking unlikely. You can say, oh, I know this guy. He's never killed anybody. Well, that's a hell of an endorsement. Unfortunately, he only has to kill one. There are batches. I mean, make no mistake. There are, there are people trying to do their part. I'm sure there's somebody out there, right? There's someone out there who's listening to me going, do you know how many of those M30s I bought from my guy? I agreed to not say this person's name on my show again because of his kid. And they're not wanting to ever put that up. But you know who I'm talking about. If you've been here for any length of time, he and I had this conversation. I swear to God, word for word. He said to me, look, man, I know I know what's in what I'm buying. I know it's F, right? Meaning fent. But it ain't xylazine. It ain't trank, right? And it's never more than it's supposed to be. I also read the autopsy report. I have it. And he was killed by trank, right? His dealer, who he trusted, I'm sure not in having a clue that he was doing it. The dealer doesn't know. They buy a big fat ass sack of pills from somebody that brought them across the border. Right. And it got touched so many times. It, it went from one. I'm, trust me. It, it, it didn't. It was not near the border of Mexico. This got sold a long way away from there. It got touched by plenty of hands. But when that pill press pulled that one down, it killed my friend. And the laws that we were discussing yesterday, right? The person who took cash is the drug dealer. The person who spent cash is the drug user. If I spend cash to buy a drug, which I then do with four friends, two of them die. I'm not a drug dealer. That's an unfortunate friggin' event that happened among people addicted to drugs. But I'm not a drug dealer. A drug dealer sells drugs. Consumers buy drugs and then use them. You understand? It's, it's a frustrating thing to me to listen to people who seem pretty educated in this kind of crap. Right? If, you've, if you have spent the vast majority of your life putting people in prison for this stuff, 
This should be pretty obvious. I'm not trying to be disrespectful. Truthfully, I'm not. But holy hell, dealer. Money comes in. That This girl, Cammie, um, when I said uh, that it, it's the all-American looking couple, what I mean is from a marketing standpoint, come on, let's be real. They're, they're white. Right? She's thin. She's blonde. This is a great news story. And it's a great news story to highlight this law. But there are dozens of people that have already been charged under the same law. But they don't have teeth. Keeping it real. They don't have teeth, right? Or they're the wrong color. This is a great front page pay, pay, uh, article. And that's what I was really driving at when I said it's more of a golden couple kind of thing. I wasn't saying, boy, I love these two. I was saying from a marketing standpoint, she's 35 and white and blonde. Right? And he's a freaking judge. If this story takes place in a trailer park, Right. I'm, I'm not being I'm just keeping it real. And one guy delivers pizzas for a living. Right. And his uh, and his friend is just, uh, you know, a girl he's dating. This does not make the news. They're still going to charge the person, but it doesn't make the news. <laughs> Keep it real. It doesn't. But this was a lawyer. This was a judge, an associate judge. But boy, if you didn't watch Surviving the Survivor, get your butt back there and watch it. Because it is an educational program, more educational than anything I've ever done on the lifeboat. I promise. In an hour. More education. I come on here and I do an us versus them thing that I catch a lot of crap for. Right? I do. I catch a lot of crap for this. Now, I got a ton of normies here. A ton of people here that have never done dope. When I say an us versus them, I'm not talking about people who haven't done dope. I'm talking about people who have the buck up. You know, you can beat this. Quit being such a wimp attitude. Um, that's killing people. Sorry, but you saw it on display, and it's killing people faster than friggin' fentanyl. How you like that? Sure, he's a hell of a guy. Out there fighting on the front lines, trying to keep this stuff out of the hands of kids. Great idea. Fantastic concept. But the buck up thing kills more people than the drugs. The reason that kids don't go to parents and say, I have to have something fierce, man. I started eating some pills with a friend of mine. They were just fun. You know what I mean? And I did it like nine days. Now, if I don't take these, I can't explain to you what it feels like. It's not such a tough conversation to have. Unless the world has made you think you're a leper if you say those words. Or how you're going to be viewed is you're weak. Okay? You don't need to go through the world self-medicating. Buck up. Well, see, the problem with that is... Self-medicating or medicating, which is really, I think, that there's a bunch of us that need medication. Right? Statistically speaking, about 50 out of 100. <laughs> right? So that buck up stuff, you wouldn't say it to a diabetic. You wouldn't say it to somebody who has cancer. Don't say it to somebody who's addicted to drugs because I... Mother loving promise you that it is a disease just the same way as any of the other ones. And I know that there are people who can't wrap their brain around this, and I understand that. I really do. I understand that. Especially if you've been burned by someone like me at some point in your life. If you dated a drug addict who, who, who cleaned out a bank account, or if somebody ripped you off, you know, you had a car that got stolen, or you a drug addict hurt you, then you definitely get a completely different view. And if you work for the Drug Enforcement Agency, you're going to have a different view of, of, of um, people on drugs. Sadly, there's no war on drugs. There's a war on drug users. Right? We know who sold the drugs to Cami, Right? 
a guy named Blue and a guy named T. We read the article. We know who sold them to her. We know what house they live in. But I know Cammie Ludwig by, by first and last name. The drug dealers, I know by Blue and T. How come we don't know Blue and T's name? Mm. How come they haven't arrested Blue and T? Well, I bet they're not blonde and hot. For real, we know who did it. Have they chased it from Blue and T all the way up to the next line? Because it would be nice to know who pulled the damn pill press. That might be the person to do this. But see, we're an idiot nation. Not, not us. Not us. The people writing the laws are idiots. And I don't care what party you're on, by the way. Idiots. So we don't write laws until it's too late. And then we write laws that don't punish. It just gets the people who are mad at us off our back. We, the people, are the boss of the idiots writing laws. So what happens is a mother loses her 14-year-old daughter and gets pissed. See, the only people that honestly get angry enough to write letters, the only people who really get angry enough to protest and to go out and do things and to start screaming and making noise are people that lost loved ones, right? They'll get angry and they'll keep screaming until somebody starts answering them. And then you get bills like the one that they wrote in Texas. Now somebody can come back to all of those parents and you've seen the press conferences where they come out and they say, you know what? The next time somebody you know, brings fentanyl into a party and three people die, that person's going to prison. Boy, you showed them, huh? Those cartels south of the border are shaking like a uh, sex toy. I promise. Yeah, God, I'm terrified. How in the hell is that fighting the war on drugs? The drug addict at that party, the fact that he's at the party probably means he's partying. I, in my experience, don't ever remember partying with drug dealers. The drug dealers simply drop off the dope. 99.9% of the ones I knew that sold heroin didn't do heroin. That would get you fired instantly. Right? It's kind of like uh, working at a bank, right? For a bank robber. You, you can't have a heroin addict selling heroin. You know, it honestly, in all of the years that I remember, I remember one, one time where they had a guy deliver dope who was addicted to it. And honestly, that's in three decades. I remember one delivery guy who was addicted to dope. And it was the funniest crap in the world because he was addicted to speedballs. Quick story. But um, I got in the car. I was probably two times bigger than this dude. I'm not exaggerating. Like I was. I was probably 250 at the time, and I bet this guy was about a buck and a quarter. But he was shooting blow. He was shooting cocaine, which makes you paranoid, right, badly. So as I'm getting out of this guy's car, I already handed him money. I got the, the stuff. It comes in balloons. I put it in my pocket. And as I'm getting out of the car, I dropped my phone. So it fell behind the, his seat. And I went, hey, hold on. My, you my phone's in your car. And as I reach back in, he goes, ah, and jams his foot on the gas, right? And my boy Jack is in the back seat. Like my guy's still in the car. And he's dragging me uh, from the vehicle. <laughs> I got one foot in the car. I'm holding onto the door. I go, what are you doing, dude? Stop I'm trying to get my phone. He's completely 100% convinced I'm trying to rob him. And finally, Jack got a hold of the guy's steering wheel basically got him to put on the brakes or we were going to go off the uh, the side of the road. And I got my phone off from behind the seat and went, what is wrong with you? I already paid you. People who rob you don't normally hand you cash. You know, like I, when I got out of the car, Jack was like, dude, he spun. You didn't see like, you, you know, I said, you know, I didn't catch that. I was holding on to the door frame, trying not to bounce along the road. He's like, no, he's jacked. He's completely... So, but we called uh, the dispatch and said, hey, your boy just dragged me for about a, a half a mile from his car. I think he might be uh, sampling the product. 
And uh, not only did uh, the guy fire him, it was his brother, but not only did he fire him, but uh, I was rewarded for turning him in. But uh, yeah, you don't, you don't see drug dealers again. Hi, not in my experience. Now, weed guys, sure, that's that's different. You know, the guy you buy weed from probably does a bong hit with you when you go over there. The guy you're buying heroin from ain't doing heroin. You know, that my experience. You no, know, everybody's is different. But I I lived in the uh, in the era of there were two ways that you bought dope, and one was you went to a building and they lowered down a bucket. You threw money in a bucket, the bucket went back up, and then the dope came back down. That was how you bought it. The other way is you dial the phone number. And this was this was the the why I say read the book Wonderland. Because back in the day, you had to know a dope man. You had to know a guy that could get dope. Or you had to know a building with a bucket. Once they made it into a delivery system, I can get it. We can get it to wherever you live in 10 minutes. That was the end of the game. That was the game changer. A small town called Navarrete in Mexico, where, where all of these little cells came from. Great book. Got to read Wonderland. It's an amazing, amazing book. And I think it's called Wonderland. So every time I do this, somebody has to correct me on this. Pretty sure it's called Wonderland. And hummingbird, I'm so sorry. I thoughts and prayers with you. There's there's nothing worse than healing without. I am uh, it's something I'm terrified of, honestly. Is uh, healing without pain meds. Um, and yeah, prayers, thoughts and prayers for the fever breaks, please. Dreamland, thank you. Cooler by the lake. I did say cooler by the lake, did it not? It's a great name, Cooler by the Lake. And I can't remember the last time I was at a lake. I really can't. It's been a hot minute. Spanky was probably there, but it's been a hot minute. Uh, at least gone in when I should, I should say. I drove by Tahoe last year, but I didn't get in it. Um, okay, thank you. I'm really glad that you said this, ASAP Lizzie. The male actor you're referring to is John Holmes. And there was, I have not seen the Val Kilmer film, but there was a, uh, there is a book written about a drug deal that went bad on street i believe called wonderland and uh it's called the wonderland murders and john holmes was actually yeah like tied up smack dab in the middle of it they also they also put that scene into boogie nights that is an homage to that to the wonderland murders as well but it started out as people trying to rob a coke dealer and then the guns came out and everything went went bad but Yes, that is what you are referring to. And i that's not the book I'm talking about. The book I'm talking about is uh, written by an investigative journal, journalist. And it chronicles the proliferation of heroin in, in, the, uh, in North America and how this happened. How these guys got so damn good, so fast at taking over a town. You know, this was... Think about this for a second, because this is kind of fascinating, right? Heroin is one of the most addictive substances on planet Earth. We can all agree on this. So what if you had a crap load of it right, that you could pay pennies for, but you were trying to figure out how to get it to a bunch of people who don't want to do it, right? Now, they're addicted to the exact same stuff, but they're so afraid of that because of the shape and the form that it's in. They want it in a pill. These guys got real good, real quick at calling this stuff opium, 
They got really good at marketing this drug. No joke. And how do you do it? If you got all of this, because nobody ever sits around and goes, I need a marketing plan for my crack cocaine. How are we going to sell this? Crack, it gives you energy, right? Drugs sell themselves, yeah? You would think, but no, they don't. You actually got to find people that want to do them. And more than likely, the people you find, they're going to be bums. They're not going to be people. It's easy as hell to go find people that want to get high. Finding people that want to get high that have enough money to buy all of those drugs you got gets a little bit tougher. But they were smart. They would roll into town and go, where do you find people that are more than likely uh, going to put needles in their arms? And they said, ah, methadone clinics. And they would roll into a new city. They would go directly to the methadone clinics and start handing out business cards to people they knew were trying to quit that said, First, you know, two or three days or whatever, free. Because the methadone center, they're not going to give them two days free. They're not even going to give them one day free. They put you on what's called financial detox. The first day that you don't have your money, they cut your dose in half. And that person goes, Jesus, mother. And they pick up that card that the guy gave them in the parking lot. And they call them instead. And they said, these guys, man, financial detox. You said first three days free or something like that? Yeah, drop it off. Here's my address. Ten minutes later, that guy is in your driveway. Spits the balloons out, hands them to you, drives out. It's, I'm telling you, it is an engine. It is a machine. <laughs> if that driver gets busted, right? I have watched it happen. I've been with Jack. I've sitting, been with Jack on at least three occasions where we pulled up and the guy we were going to meet was on the hood of the car right? Handcuffed. And we go, oh, crap. And you keep driving and you go, Ding. man, we're going to be sick. And the phone rings. And it's the dope man. Hey, uh, don't go to that 7-Eleven, man. That's no good. It's blown. Go to uh, Home Depot. It's going to be a different guy. and The car is going to be white. He'll be looking for you guys. I'm not joking you. It is so seamless that if one of their drivers gets busted, they just call you. And they, oh, by the way, they go, and throw out that number. We're never using it again. This is the new number. They go down the whole list. And then the guy breaks the phone. He calls everybody in that phone and then he breaks it. There, It is a machine down to what kind of cars they buy, how they buy them. They go to buy here, pay, uh, pay here places. And they walk in with fat stacks of cash. They walk out with, with a car with very little paper. And... They're going to take that car back and trade it in after 60 days, no matter what, because they're not going to have the same car showing up at the same place. I'm telling you, folks, the organization that they have right, to drop off. And now I was getting little balloons. Apparently now they're getting pills. Now, my gut, my guests would tell me that the, the pills probably are still a lot of them are still or a lot of fent is still mixed into. Fugazi into black, you know, goopy stuff that looks like heroin. Because to a guy like me, you weren't going to sell me a, a a perk thirty. You know, if I was still in the game, I'd want heroin. I would want that goopy, smelly crap because that's all I know. You know, and then what they would do is they would make it look like it, they would make it smell like it. But I promise you, you understand the the complexities of going out into a field where there's a crop. And taking the a knife and cutting the bulb, right, three times minimum. That's every bulb in, what, 500 acres, 1,000 acres? One guy ain't doing that. <laughs> hey, this is labor-intensive stuff. You go out there with knives and you, have, you got people all over the place cutting because all of that sap now has to run out. Then they got to wait, go back and collect it all. And these big burlap sacks, they walk around catching all the crap throwing all this goopy black sap so that they can then take that and do a bath with lye and muriatic acid and a bunch of other crap so that they could take it and turn it into tar heroin. Again, massively labor intensive. Takes up huge, huge swaths of land. You're not doing this in your basement. You don't have the hydroponic setup, right? Growing poppies. 
this takes a crap ton of land. But it doesn't to take any land at all to crank out the exact same thing in a lab. The drug that will do the exact same thing, only yeah, a love a lot stronger. And a hell of a lot more deadly. Plain and simple. The difference between an opiate and an opioid is one comes from Mother Nature. Yeah? Okay. Those guys out there cutting the bulbs, right? I don't care how you cut that bulb. I don't care how you mix the muriatic or the lye or what whatever ingredient you do. The strongest that that is going to get is determined <clears throat> when that plant begins to come up from the ground. The strength of the heroin has already been decided. Right? Mother Nature took care of that. It peaked before the sap even began to rant to run. The, the strength of that is predetermined. Right? That is nature. In a lab, you can keep going. Let's double that. Ah, why don't we double it one more time? Why don't we quadruple it? Or make it a thousand times stronger and we'll call it car fentanyl and we'll give it to elephants. Not to treat pain, mind you, to knock them the hell out. It's not, it's not a painkiller for a pachyderm. It is a night night. That's what you knock out an elephant with. Oh, I have a good idea. Let's see if we can't crush a little of that up and mix it into a kilo. See what happens to humans. All of us were stupid, aren't we? We really are. We are so stupid. Xylazine, the stuff that they're mixing into this stuff, right, to make trank. Xylazine is for equine and bovine use. So in the last 40 seconds, we've covered crap that uh, you put into horses cows, and elephants. Fantastic. What could possibly go wrong? Now, uh, just to keep myself, um, yesterday, the uh, actually got, um, it was nice that YouTube unsubscribes um, a ton of people these days. It's like every time you turn around, there's a crap load of people that you got unsubscribed from, you know, and it's uh, it's painful. It's like you got uh, you can honestly sit and watch during the day and just watch the numbers drop. But when I go on Surviving the Survivor and I, I do stuff with Joel or I do stuff with other people, you get a good bump and it's always fun. And uh, it was great. We got a, a great bump off of um, Surviving the Survivor last night, which is was really cool. And we got a, a fairly educated group of people, which works because the lifeboat already is a pretty educated group of people. I mean, for real. And last night was fun. It was an, a golden opportunity to talk about what we do here. I was thinking to myself, and I, I, it's going to sound crappy, but you know something? Who cares, right? Uh, I was thinking to myself while I was um, while I was listening to some of the things that were said, I was thinking you could take anybody on the lifeboat. <laughs> Not kidding you. You could take anybody on the lifeboat who's been there for any length of time and swap them and put them in my chair. And they could have done the exact same show I did. No joke. All of the, you got professionals that have spent careers in there. You could take the average Joe from the boat and they could tell them everything they wanted to know about fentanyl versus car fentanyl, right? About all of that stuff about the, 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 all you got to do is touch it. Jeez. Stop telling people that. Even if you see a cop that, that it happened to, stop telling people that because it's not, you can't take the one in a billion and then say, look what happens, right? So are there people who uh, are going to drop dead the first time they ever do an opiate? Yeah, there are. There are people, right, who are going to drop dead the first time they do cocaine, guaranteed. Does that mean you should tell your kids you're going to drop dead the first time you do cocaine? No. No. Play the numbers so that your kids realize you're not full of crap. You know, if your kid says, is it true 
you know, that if you smoke crack once, you're going to get addicted to it? I don't know, son. I know people who smoked a hit of crack and never quit smoking it. I know those people. Were they addicted on the first hit? How the hell do I know? I don't know that they know. But I know a bunch of people that started smoking it and didn't quit. You know, honesty goes a hell of a long way. If your kid doesn't think you lie to them, they will actually ask you questions and expect answers. It's a beautiful thing. It really is. Sadly, we BS a lot. You know, we BS a lot. And, and hold on a second. I really wish I had brought my glasses this morning. First time I did speed, I just uh, got out of the Sea Org. Oh, wow. And wanted to try everything and just party. Crazy night in Hollywood. Um, you know what? I remember the first time I tried speed. Uh, I had done a lot of cocaine. The, the Northeast uh, had blow all over it, but we didn't have any. I mean, we had New York had speed, right? But it didn't get into the into the sticks. It really didn't. No one was making meth or anything like that. But I remember getting crank. And it was, they didn't call it speed. They called it crank. And um, I remember doing a big line of it. And when you did a big line of cocaine, you went, oh. And, you know, you felt that crap instantly. And I did the speed and I was like, well, there's really not much to that, is it? Just burns the ever-loving crap out of your nose. That doesn't seem to do much. And then like two days later and I was still awake going, holy hell, when does this stop? You know, do you ever go to sleep? There's a big difference though in that I've never met a drug. There, there, there are, there, there's a, a certain class of drugs that you can abuse just about any way you want, right? Cocaine is that way. Um, meaning you can snort it, smoke it, shoot it, eat it boof it right any anything you want to do you can do with coke you can do with meth you can do with heroin there's there's certain drugs that you can get into your body uh, basically any way that you want um, but there are very few that the difference between smoking and shooting is so extreme that that drug is when you inject um meth it is such a different drug than when you do it any other way it is just i mean night and day if someone is on Suboxone, which prevents uh, the brain from feeling high when they take an opiate, what does a patient do if they're in acute pain and need opiate in the ER? Uh, will IV morphine not relieve their pain? Isn't that the golden question? <laughs> Isn't that the golden question? Um, well, I guess it depends on your doctor because there are a couple of different philosophies on this. Truth is this, they're going to be able to treat your pain. I promise you. I promise you. And there's about five different ways they can do it. It's not, uh, it's not one uh, uh, different way. Truthfully, they can give you painkillers. They can. They're going to have to give you um, specific ones, and they're going to have to give it to you in, uh, in... – I'm really hesitant to say to you, Here's a drug that you can do on top of Suboxone that's not going to make you sick. It is out there. In fact, th there are ways that you can do that. Absolutely, there are. And I would be a buffoon if I told people here how to do it, right? It, it might be the dumbest thing I could do. And I'm uh, the uh, the older I get, the more I feel like that's, a, that's the kind of slip up I, I would really like to avoid. Because... Truthfully, uh, Suboxone does not play well with others. And it's one of my favorite things about the drug, right? One of my favorite things about the drug is once someone's on it, it makes it real hard to abuse dope, right? Um, but you can still treat pain. You absolutely can still treat pain. So don't, don't fear that. Um, You'll, uh, if you find yourself in a situation where you break your femur or whatever, they got you. But um, I would prefer to not tell you the cocktail that they're going to put together to make that work. But I assure you that they can. Um, Virginia, yeah. The... Uh, I worked for two doctors and took some diet pills and didn't sleep for three nights. Never, 
Never, never did it again. Uh, I'm a big fan of sleep. I think I've told this story probably before on the boat, but I'll tell it to you just because it's funny. And because my old stories, my memories are so good on it. I love telling the old stories. They, uh, I remember them well. Get up here, kitty. What's happening? Uh, so we were about to go on a lockdown. Um, and you know you're going on lockdown when you start hearing the uh, the buzzers go off and the, uh, the alarms and all that. So we knew a lockdown was coming. And the <laughs> there were guards coming onto the uh, prison yard carrying shotguns okay this is not something that happens unless there's a riot you know what i mean this is not something you ever see it's scary it really is it's scary crap uh these guys were wearing their ninja turtle suits you know <laughs> with the elbow pads and the helmets and all that and, and looking really aggressive carrying steel nightsticks uh and none of us knew what had happened um as it turns out the warden had been cut uh in the uh, in the chow hall but I looked at a guy they called Mochi's, who I got stuff from, and said, hey, man, this is a lockdown. You got to help me, bro, right? Help me out. I was addicted to heroin. And then he threw me a bunch of stuff, right? Good-sized balloons. These were grams. And I was like, oh. I'm in the vent talking to the guy upstairs, gloating. And he's like, oh, no, dude. He goes, this is going to be bad. He goes, I don't know, riot or something. He's like, man, I'm going to be sick. I said, I just picked up three Gs. And he's like, oh, you got to help a dude out. Well, as it turns out, what I had was uh, speed or what they called in their shibble. But I had speed, not the other. The bummer of that is you're not going to sleep. This is going to keep you up. I ended up because I had had paint, right? And I was going to paint my cell. Anything that touches the wall leaves a black stain on it, right? Because the, the walls are white. But I had a small bucket of, uh, of white paint. And I had said to one of the guys that worked at CMS, can you give me a paintbrush so that I can just touch up the um, the walls? I don't want the black stains all over everything. Yeah, yeah, I'll get you a paintbrush. And then like a wise guy, he brings me the paintbrush you used to get in first grade in those little paint trays, remember? Like, honestly, it looks like an eyebrow pencil, like that kind of uh, thin kind of paintbrush. And I was like, ah, funny. Well, we went on lockdown. I'm the only dude in that cell. And I got three grams of speed in that little brush. And I painted the inside of that cell. Every black mark on the inside of that cell, I painted with that paintbrush. I'm not joking until it was over. And uh, one of the cops comes by like two days later and knocked on the window and scared the crap out of me. And I turned around and he goes, Rock, what do you want? I said, what? He goes, what the F are you on? I go, what are you talking about, dude? He goes, you just painted your entire cell with a Q-tip. That light hasn't gone off in 72 hours. He goes, I'm not stupid, man. He's like, for God's sakes, turn the light off. You're going to make us all look, look uh, we're going to make us all get busted. I was up for three days painting the inside of my cell with, a, uh, with the smallest paintbrush you've ever seen. All right, this cat is going to have to be dealt with, people. I'm, uh, I'm going to have to leave a little early because... If not, I'm going to have to admit I can't keep my arm in this position, that I'm just not strong enough, and I, I can't go out like that. So I'm Captain Tommy. See this here? here? That is a uh, about a 10 or 11-pound shoulder kitty that just does not understand that shoulder kitties are supposed to weigh two pounds. I will see you all in the next one. I'm Captain Tommy, and this is Squirrel Nut Zipper. We'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye, Spanky. God bless. Thanks. God bless. Do 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 do.